You're listening to the CD Baby. CD Baby. CD Baby DIY Musician Hey there, and welcome to episode number 77 of the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast. My name is Kevin, and joining me for this roundtable edition is Chris and Bolton. It's Bolton? Still, it's still Bolton, right? Yes. What the hell is Bolton? <laughs> I'm still going by Bolton. No. You weren't what? frightened out of that by the caller in the last episode? No, no, I'm, I'm tough. Yeah, it, it's uh, we're we're knee deep in the the winter or not winter, the winter holiday of our discontent. The winter <laughs> in the holiday selling season. So I hope uh, artists listening are getting some bump in sales and also that uh, putting to good use some ideas we've chatted about. We've got uh, we'll talk more about some of that stuff later. Um, we've got uh, some news coming up and a recap of our episode. And we also have lots of phone calls. I could not believe the number of phone calls. Really? The Twitter Great. controversy is raging. The name change controversy is raging. Really? Awesome. Really? People still have problems with Bolton? Oh, man. So uh, we'll get to those but you'll have to wait till the end of the podcast for those goodies. Lots of great stuff. <laughs> or so, fast forward. No, no, you can't fast forward a podcast. <laughs> Don't tell them that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, so let's get in some news. CD Baby. CD Baby. Music. Music. News. All right, here are the news headlines for this episode. Well, rumors are flying that Apple is reportedly close to acquiring Lala, the digital retail site that recently partnered with Google to return music search results. Talks are very advanced, according to CNET. One of the sources said that this, the sides already agreed on terms and have only to sign the final agreement. It's uncertain what Apple has planned, but it could be a signal that Apple understands that they will need to break beyond the iTunes store to continue their music domination. The shine might be coming off of Spotify a bit. Lady Gaga's Poker Face was one of the most popular tracks for five months on Spotify, being played more than one million times. But... According to reports, the Swedish Performing Rights Society only paid her $167 for those performances. If true, it serves to confirm other artists' complaints about insufficient payment. Many in the music industry have been quick to declare that streaming will be its savior, but serious questions remain how long rights holders and artists should wait for a reasonable payday. Traffic to Twitter was down a dramatic 27.8% between September and October, according to Nielsen, an e-marketer. Comscore showed Twitter's unique visitors were down 8.1% in October, and Compete reported a 2.1% decline. But wide swings in Twitter use are common, and any trend downward could also be attributed to increased use of third-party apps and smartphones to access the service. The Nielsen, Compete, and Comscore measurements reflect unique web visitors. 18 million U.S. adults use Twitter. And those are the headlines that found interesting. little news item there to help fuel the Twitter controversy we've got going in the listener comments. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, uh, iTunes buying uh, Lala, that's big news if it happens. Yeah, and uh, Lala was one of those services. We've been distributing music to them for a long time here at CD Baby. And, uh, you know, it just seemed kind of obscure. And then suddenly they burst on the scene with uh, the big announcement that they're partnering with Google to um, power search results. And uh, so now everybody wants to be on there. And so this could be a a really timely move for Apple. So right now, isn't Lala somehow affiliated with Rhapsody? No. no? They're just their own thing. Yeah, they're their own thing. Totally their own thing. Okay. I'm just misinformed. Lala is a retail um, store, basically, but you have, like, what, what's unique about it? Well, there's several things that are interesting about what they're doing, and uh, there are some people 
who work here at CD Baby that absolutely love the service. Basically, uh, when you sign up with them, you can purchase songs for ten cents to add to your streaming catalog online, and so you have unlimited access to stream them anytime. You can also upload your entire iTunes catalog onto their cloud computer, so you can access your entire iTunes catalog through their website from any computer.、Oh, okay. So all the music that you've purchased、um, will will be available to you anywhere. You won't have to have your computer. Authorized. So, so, if you're at your work computer, or you're at the library, or whatever, you can throw on some headphones and listen to your music. Yeah, you just go to the website and log in your username and stuff. And、uh, you can also buy downloads from them, but it's a very nice looking site.、Um, I think if you sign up, they give you like 25 free web stream purchases, which、uh, I signed up, but then I didn't do because I, I personally I can't stand the sound listening to music streaming just because the quality is so much lower than. What you would normally get, but、uh, it's a cool-looking service, and it, it seems like they've kind of got a unique thing going there. And if Apple's gonna get in the in the game with them, but Twitter, the you know the the interesting thing about that is that、um, I've noticed a serious decline in、uh, the posts from people I follow and myself as well. My my decline hasn't necessarily been due to.、Uh, The lack of interest, but just that、uh, I've been extremely busy、uh, doing a lot of other things like recording and playing music and playing for several artists, one being my own band, and just haven't、uh, had the. But therein lies the problem with Twitter, because once you get busy doing the things that you need to to generate your art and your music, you have less time and less interest in. In doing things like Twitter, and、yeah. weren't you noticing sort of a decline with Facebook posts amongst your friends as well? Yeah, I mean, it seems like, and I didn't know if it was just the holidays,、uh, but leading up to Thanksgiving, it just seemed like the number of people posting dropped off drastically and interacting, not just posting. And you know, I, I, I should say, I have still been posting on Twitter and and Facebook, but just not as frequent.、Mm-hmm. And、um, and I was noticing that amongst other people because I look at Facebook a lot more than、I、actually post on there,、um, but it just seemed to have declined. Uh, the people that are posting and interacting, there's still you know like the handful of people that post incessantly that are posting constantly. But other than that, I've been noticing a lot less. And I don't know if it was the holidays, if、uh, everyone got bored and left, or <laughs> or what. Well, I think that too, like you know, people probably go through phases. Like if you go to go out and follow a whole bunch of active users right now. Maybe like a year from now, some of those people would start dropping off and slowing down. I think that you know, especially for businesses or musicians, you know, like when you're doing a promotional push, you're going to be tweeting a lot, and when you're you know busy touring, you probably won't be. But、um, I think that some of the statistics that they mention could be skewed because people are using third-party clients like TweetDeck could be also telling because. Twitter didn't really even make sense to me until I started using TweetDeck, and then I was like, "Oh, <laughs> like this could be really useful." More people discover those services; they may not be going directly to the website; they may be using TweetDeck or whatever. Yeah, and those stats are just people going actually to Twitter.com and using it. But if the decline is that great, that also means you know people have to go to the site originally to sign up, and usually people using third-party clients are going to hit. Twitter.com occasionally, whether to adjust something with the profile or whatever,、right. which some of the third-party clients can let you will let you do, but that、uh, probably means that there's not as many people signing up as quickly. Yeah, maybe in the case of Facebook, you did something that really offended a bunch of people, and they all defriended. That's、you. what I was wondering. I'm like, <laughs> no one comments on anything. I've been commenting on people's stuff, and. Nobody likes me anymore. <laughs>、uh, I woke and up I, and I had 400 less friends on Facebook. What the heck happened? I've got blank heads for everybody. <laughs> all my friends on Facebook. <laughs> We've got comments about、uh, the the Twitter issue, but、uh, I'd be curious to hear、um, if people are noticing that on Facebook as well. If it's just the holiday seasons, or holiday season, or if everyone just、uh, decided to move on. So、um, feel free to email us, or you can call a listener not listener line at. Two zero six four two six five six eight three. Leave your comments, or send us a tweet, or send us a tweet. Yeah. All right. Well, before we do our little、uh, episode recap, I was going to mention that、uh, you know we we talked about a couple episodes ago about things you should be doing for the. 
the holidays to get your music out there and just wanted to check in with you guys, see if you guys are doing anything. I know my band's been doing some stuff. You've been doing a lot, way more than me. No, I haven't. I'm working on a new album right now, so I don't really have anything new necessarily to promote, and I haven't shot any video of that in a while. But So I just ran a sale. I put my uh, CDs into the $5 sale bin at CD Baby up through Christmas. So we'll, we'll see how that does. All of them? All of them. The, my three solo CDs and my band's CD as well, yep. Well, that's cool. So people could buy three of your you albums. Get the whole catalog for 20 bucks. Wow, that's a good deal. I know. Chris Robley. Chris Robley. <laughs> that's right. Well, I, I'm sort of embarrassed to say that I've done very little more than schedule practice um, for my band this holiday so season. That's an important that's, first step. That could be a, a titanic feat, though, with your... Well, how many people are in your band? Like, Nine people, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's, so. that, that makes me want to give up just hearing that number. <laughs> and, you know, every practice, somebody's got to leave early or someone's got to go... Um, can't stay late or, you know, we can't... My brother can't get a babysitter or whatever, so it's always a little bit of an adventure. Hmm. I don't. We don't have a product yet, really, to sell. We've only played a few shows, and uh, and we're looking at maybe going into the you know studio sometime next year. But um, we're we're sort of we're putting along. <laughs> well, uh, we've been doing. We've been busy trying to uh, capitalize on uh, the season. That sounds horrible. Capitalize on the season. Yeah, but, why not? <laughs> That's what this podcast is about. Drink when when, when I when I said that, I was meaning more the the idea that uh, our EP ended up being taking longer to get done than we thought it would, which is always the case. But uh, there was some other outside circumstances out of out of our control. That's that, not what you meant. You meant using the magic and spirit of Christmas in order to make money. That's right. <laughs> but anyway, so we kind of got in this place where. Uh, originally we were thinking an album release show in December, but that we bumped back to, um, January. And so we kind of had this gap of time of what should we do? And we had talked about doing a Christmas song earlier, but we were kind of knee deep in doing the EP. And so we started recording a Christmas song and making videos of the process. That's many, many videos. So far three, but, uh, (laughs) they're good though. And they're short. So it's not like a huge investment i see them on facebook i'm like oh i can watch this and it'll be done in a minute yeah yeah and 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 peter our drummer who also works here at cd baby and does the other podcasts with me he's doing a great job just throwing those together quickly i think that's been kind of the key is that uh you know when when the videos i've put together it's like i'll sit there and piece them together (laughs) and a month goes by and but it's been like you know some of them have been posted within hours of us actually working on the song. Mm-hmm. So oh, that's cool. So it's been kind of cool to see a little bit of the process. And then we plan on just uh, sending this to everyone on our email list for free and, and such. So if you're interested, you can uh, go to our website, hellomorningband.com. Actually, the whole EP is up there now, too. You can hear it as well. It's on CD Baby for sale digitally. We haven't gotten the CDs back yet, so we're working on that. But, yeah. We're going to give that away. And uh, if you sign up on our email list, you might also get a free song off the album. Mm-hmm. Who knows? Maybe. It's a good you definitely technique. F- so you fall into the camp of uh, as soon as you've got something you can put out, put it out, regardless of... Uh... Yeah, and I, if, yeah, if people read the DIY Musician blog, there's a post on there like, uh, I think, yeah, it was the, is the album release show still relevant? And part of the reason why I was thinking about that is because we had the EP done and all the mastered files, but then duplication was going to take longer than expected. And so, you know, which bumped the release back to January and just thinking, well, we're obviously not going to have everything in place for the whole holiday season. So, um, better but is it, is it important? Is it is important to hold on to everything or is it better to, uh, so we release it all at once in January or is it better just to start putting it out on, on the web now so we opted for putting it out on the the web now and yeah check it out (laughs) i'd love to hear listener feedback it's always uh interesting you know because we sit here and do these podcasts and give advice to artists but uh it's tough doing this stuff and it's not easy as it's easier just to sit around telling people what to do it's another (laughs) particular i know robert lee king is listening i particularly would love to hear what he has to say you know what i i meant to uh i meant to send him a free copy i will do that all right he will have a free copy, and he can tell us what he thinks. <laughs> Stick to your day job. <laughs> <laughs> Early reviews are good. 
Yeah, no, it's good. I enjoy it. But uh, I'm sure someone will hate it. If you're an artist doing some sort of promotion or uh, some sort of have some sort of tip for the holiday season, we're still going to have one more roundtable edition before Christmas. At that point, it'll obviously be too late to do a lot of the ideas, but it's still cool to hear what people are doing and um, share on the show uh, that might be inspiration for next year so while we're all thinking about Christmas. So <laughs> feel free to call or email. Well, let's get into uh, our discussion and recap of uh, last week's episode where I interviewed Corey Smith. And uh, like I said on the, the podcast, it was about uh, maybe last spring, I believe, when Corey was getting all that media attention where it came out that he, his business being, you know, his music was grossing millions of dollars. Like he said, the exact figure, I think, got a little exaggerated to four million, but uh, he said that he could safely say two million. So, uh, you know, at first I was even a little skeptical when I saw those headlines. I'm like, okay, right. And then he, he sells through CD Baby, so got to know a little bit more about his story and yeah, like you heard in the interview, he just it wasn't like he spends all this time doing Twitter and Facebook and, and such. It was just playing a lot of bars and connecting with people. And that was the other interesting thing to me is that it was bars because um, I know that a lot of artists complain about the fact that they have to play bars where people really aren't there to hear them. And Corey kind of mentioned that, how he didn't want to play cover songs. And, uh, but that's kind of what you're expected to do in that bar scene. Right. Well, and he also said he didn't want to just play, he didn't want to just be background music. He wanted to charge a cover and he could, you know, he could tell the bartender or the bar owners, like, I can bring a crowd, you know, like he knew that once he had built up his following that he, he could definitely like bring in some money to the bar and charge at the door. Mm -hmm. And I know that approach wouldn't work for everyone. Um, you know, there's certain genre groups, obviously, that aren't going to fit in that scene. But I, the other interesting thing is he was doing it in small cities, small towns. You know, he was around Athens, Georgia, which has, you know, it's big college there. But at the same time, it's a really small town and you're not going to have a lot of options for venues. So you're going to have to kind of head out to some of the little towns in the area and try and play those venues as well. And it just kind of... So how Snowball. many uh, how many shows do you have to play a year to make two million dollars? <laughs> <laughs> well, now I'm sure he's touring just nonstop. I mean, when I was interviewing him, he was on a tour bus. Yeah, um, and you got to play a lot. I hope it came through on the the interview. I'm pretty sure he mentioned it, but just in case, the kind of touring they're doing they are taking on all the responsibilities of like booking the show. I'm sure in certain cases they have promoters that they're working with, but a lot of the times, you know, he was talking about breaking into certain markets. A lot of times they are going in and renting a venue based on, you know, that they've played clubs or bars in that area and drawn a crowd and grown and grown. And so next time they're going to go and rent the venue and kind of promote the show themselves. So that's where, you know, he's for touring, taking on a lot of the costs. So it if takes you rent the venue, you make you, you don't have to pay out the the venue and the bar bartenders and the yeah. I mean, it's a little different scenario. I mean, it's the upside is better, the downside is worse. You know, if you rent a venue as opposed to just get put on a bill that someone else is promoting, if your draw sucks that night, I mean, chances are you're still going to get paid. You know, whatever contractually you're obligated, but. The worst is, you know, you don't get invited back. Right. Where if you rent the venue and it all goes bad, you know, you've got to pay. Still got to pay them. Yeah. So, so, but yeah, I thought it was a, a he had lots of good advice. There he was. He did talk about actually not uh, jumping too quickly to a larger venue, though, and that that had been one of his mistakes. Right at some point, he wished he had kind of been happier with smaller crowds. Yeah, I, I've seen that happen to artists before. Uh, where, you know, they're playing like, like here in town, there's a, a very good club called the Doug Fur Lounge, where oh, I think the capacity is 300. For a good band, it's pretty easy to start getting that pretty full and start thinking, well, we need to move up to the Crystal Ballroom or yeah. something that holds more people because, you know, we've sold out the 300 seat venue two times. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's where he was saying that, you know, once you j make that jump, the responsibilities go way up and also the chances of not making money go up because right. you've got a lot much larger overhead. 
Uh, we had some comments on the episode, and uh, of course, Robert Lee King was one of them. Oh, let's hear it. <laughs> he said, I'm a bit taken aback at, at uh, his comment regarding not being able to make a commercial sounding record for $20,000. Many of the finest albums in history were produced, recorded, mixed, and mastered for a great deal less. Two personal favorites, Meet the Beatles and Black Sabbath's self-titled album, were both made for well under $1,000. And uh, he said in Black Sabbath's case, just over $300. I might interject, though. <laughs> yeah. Is he talking in Meet the Beatles, what's that, 1963? Mm -hmm. $1,000 back then was more than $1,000 now. Yeah. And it was recorded at EMI's studio, which was back then what top of the line yeah so they were going well and the thing is that would not work today as far as like if i went to a radio station by by more commercial Corey was saying that they were trying to get some radio hits with you know this new album and and by hits i don't necessarily even mean it, a hit on radio but just radio actually giving them the light of day you know mm -hmm. if a new artist went to a, ra a radio station with an album that sounded like I Meet the Beatles, they would not get played. They would tell them it's not broadcast quality and they would turn them away. So um, that's more of what he was talking about, having that commercial appeal. And, uh, you know, it was kind of a, a, a risk he was taking in order to see if uh, that would help and to broaden their audience. And, you know, in the end, he might like he might go back to making records for less that sound a little bit more lo-fi. I think further on in the comments, uh, Robert or somebody also mentioned that price tag being ridiculous and you can record an amazing sounding album for much less at home. And, and that while that is true, you can record an amazing album at home for, for less money. You're not going to have access to studios, those rooms that sound great, to gear, to to instruments and also that included that one of the commenters pointed out um the uh instrumentalists that played on the album mm -hmm. so i mean all those people are getting paid within that where a lot of indie artists think you know their fee just covers gear and the usage of it but you know the bigger records you get the chance bigger the chance that uh you're gonna have some fancy players especially on if you want to bring in string players that play in tune and quickly i mean that's really pricey yeah Daniel, who commented on the episode, said, I think one single fact impressed me more than anything else in this, the fact that he's now able to salary the musicians in the band. Think about what that means for a moment. Both the costs and the luxuries it affords you as an artist. Awesome. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, that's, I think the hardest thing for someone who's a solo artist is getting people to consistently believe in you, other musicians, if, you know, if you're touring with a band, and also make time to make you a priority and the only way you're going to do that is with money and otherwise you're going to have a rotating band constantly or you're just not you know touring nationally you know so yeah it's like sort of like a minimal commitment for the people that are invested yeah yeah so yeah it's, it's a cool story how he was able to uh you know just build it up and he's obviously got some smart people working for him you know his manager seems like a smart guy making good decisions and you know Corey also said that he makes or takes calculated risks, not, you know, just doesn't take stabs at things. So um, I think he referred to a calculated risk being when he quit his job because mm -hmm. it had built up so much that it was kind of like, he wasn't just going, I'm going to be a musician now, but it yeah. was kind of like, okay, this seems to be trending this direction. So I'm going to take a risk that um, with a lot of thought behind it. Right. So. And he had that same voice for, for several areas. Don't get a manager until you need one. Don't get a booking agent until you yeah. need yeah. one, all that stuff. Publicist. And we've heard that before from other people on the podcast saying, you know, like don't don't think you need a manager or booker until, you know, it's big enough that you could afford to pay them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So it'll be interesting to see where his career goes, if it's kind of peaked and just maintains or if he does actually break into... Um, mainstream culture because he's still you know a relatively unknown as far as like press is concerned and um, especially outside of the south but if you go on his website he has some diehard fans like he has lots of videos being created by his fans and so it's pretty interesting to see how dedicated someone is and how this guy's reached a certain level and without that kind of uh, mainstream uh, 
Tony would say mind share, but I dare not use that <laughs> word. <laughs> well, I think his songwriting is, is um, I think he's doing exactly what he needs to in order to get that kind of success eventually because I haven't heard a lot of his music, but what I have heard, it seems sort of intelligently done, but also very folksy. It's not going over anyone's head. You know, they're, they're like these anthems for the common people. So it almost is, his music just based on what he's writing is like inviting right off the bat. Like uh, I connected with it and I I don't even like that kind of music, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think he, he has a very calculated way of, of, you know, presenting his, his art and writing music and conducting his business. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well said. Well, we've got a lot of comments and uh, phone calls specifically. So uh, we should probably move on to those. But if you'd like to comment on uh, Corey's, the episode 76 with Corey Smith, you can give us a call, 206-426-5683, or email us at info at cdbabypodcast.com, or leave a comment in the show notes at the podcast website. Uh, right. Well, let's get into some phone calls. CD Baby. CD Baby Podcast. Message line. 206-426-5683. The number you have dialed. 206-426-5683. Hey, CD Baby folks. This is Evan Hamilton from Monsters Are Not Myths. You can find us on CD Baby, of course. Um, I'm listening to your interview with Josh Rosenthal, um, and I really love it. One thing that uh, made me nervous is he's advocating Facebook groups, and my understanding is that after you get over 2,000, uh, whatever they call them, friends, fans on the group, you actually can't message the whole group anymore. Uh, So that's obviously a huge downside. Unless they've changed it, I would be wary about doing a group versus a page. All right, love the podcast. Thanks. Hey guys, great show. Uh, this is Grant calling from Fontaine. That's Fontaine with a PH um, from Vancouver, Canada. A um, couple tips, nothing in particular to any show, but we've been making table cards and we put them on all the tables at venues we play. They basically have a quote, a picture of our album, and, uh, and just all the same branding we use on the album, on the card. And the venue owners really appreciate the... Uh, having that in their venue as well. They think it looks pretty slick. Um, That's helped us sell more CDs live, and also just video tape your show for your own reference, and you can sit down as a band later and just watch it and critique yourselves and think about how you can make yourselves look um, better and make your songs look um, different from each other by how you position yourself. Um, Don't hand it to a friend because they'll zoom in and out all the time, just put on a tripod and just leave it there. Anyway, thanks. Grant from Fontaine. Great show. Listen to every episode. Love it. Thanks. Hey, guys. Uh, it's uh, Andy Effler here. Uh, I thought I'd call and, and, and uh, touch base a little bit. I'm, I'm uh, downloading these new podcasts here as we speak. I see that you guys had my buddy Josh Rosenthal on. Uh, we, I, my, one of my first gigs was opening up for Josh back in Lubbock, Texas. Uh, so I was excited to see him climbing the ranks more. He's a hardworking guy, deserves the attention. Uh, also, I wanted to talk a little bit more about Twitter and why I don't like it, why why I don't get it as an artist. Um, being that all art uh, is one-sided, is you know I make it without any um, input, you know obviously. Um, it just seems to me Twitter is kind of um, pointless for what I do. Uh, most of what I do is on Facebook, kind of starting interesting conversations, and that's where my work's really paying off. But I don't really need, and I don't understand why anybody well like me would need um, another one-sided way to communicate. Um, I don't know. I, I don't get it. I don't get Twitter, and I don't get why it's a good idea. <laughs> um, and yeah, I don't. I'm Matt Ebel, <laughs> uh, and Matt Ebel dot com. Uh, he called in and was saying that I didn't know what I was talking about. And he's right. <laughs> Matt Evil's right. Uh, I usually don't know what I'm talking about. But um, I would encourage artists maybe to look at ways to communicate with people more than just blasting a message out there over and over again. Um, I don't know. It seems like, for me, getting it back from the uh, the audience, for lack of a better term, uh, the online audience, that's way more beneficial as an artist. Um, 
and I think affects the listener a lot more. I don't know. So eat it, evil. <laughs> no, he's a, he's a great American. Uh, thanks a lot, guys. Love what you do. Andy Epler, andyepler.com. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the little Twitter feud we've got going on yeah. in the listener comments. we got another Twitter comment I'll play in a second, but I wanted to put a little break there. Uh, I, you know, you the don't... war of uh, of andyepler dot com and matthewebel.com. dot com. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you know, don't use Twitter if you don't like it. That's cool. Yeah, <laughs> it, I don't think it's as one sided as he thinks it is. Right. Maybe. I mean, you can generate some sort of discussion and and two way communication. Right. I don't right. like how you do that as well as you do uh, as you can, you can on Facebook. Use, you can use Twitter to discuss things and and reach out to people and you know, it's the I don't know. I mean, I think that uh I like Twitter for certain reasons and I think it's useful for, you know, like the the other day um I was coaching my brother on using his his Twitter account for his design business. You know, and I was like, look, you can follow all the people in Portland that are doing design. You can look up people who are um, looking for web designers and you can reach out to them and say, hey, I'm a web designer. You can see everybody on Twitter who said I'm having problems with my website. You know, you can do these searches and then you can communicate with those people. And in Facebook, it's more of a closed realm. You can't reach out to those people as easily as you can in Twitter because it's more public. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that that's, to me, what's exciting about Twitter. If you're, you know, if you're looking to reach out to a certain amount of people, want to see what people are talking about, what they're thinking about, you know, you can do these great searches and just see a cross-section of what, you know, people are are, uh, communicating about on Twitter. So that's what I like about it. But I think that, you know, it's not as maybe as intimate as some other social networks. Yeah. Well said. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm speechless. Uh, before we go to the next Twitter comment, um, I wanted to mention the Facebook groups. Uh, the other downside of a Facebook group is that if you have a band and you want to post something as your band, whenever you post in a Facebook group, It'll actually just use your personal profile as the posting image. So um, you can email everybody, but it'll come like if I have my band and we've got a group and there's a thousand people, instead of getting it from the band, if I email them, it'll get come from Kevin, and which may or may not be good. I don't know. Uh, and was his fear accurate that once you have above 2,000 you know, fans? I, I, you... I didn't look into that, but I've heard that same rumor, but honestly, Facebook literally changes things weekly. Yeah, they just changed two days ago. Yeah, right? and it keeps changing, and so it's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny how they're determined to make everybody not like it, but uh, it still grows. Hmm. Um, but yeah, they keep changing things, so I'm not sure if that's still the case. I know they've had several terms of service type changes, which may affect some of that. I would say that you know, since the the pages are is Facebook's answer to to self marketing, like that's where they're going to put the tools. That's where they're going to you know like be listening to businesses. And um, I think that that using an alternative method like groups is a lot more risky as far as like getting everyone to sign up there and then finding out in the end you can't use that feature and you have to move everybody over to your pages. Yeah, and I, I think the groups are kind of confusing now because they used to look more like forums where things were posted. Now they just look like a regular page. And to me, it kind of eliminated a lot of the usefulness. And then combine that with the way it makes posts happen, uh, where with a page, you may be able to do it as a group. I haven't tried, but pages, you can make tabs and put full HTML websites right into them. So um, if anyone has any more thoughts on that, feel free to let us know. But uh, And then I liked uh, Grant from Fontaine, his idea of making cards that, uh, you know, if you're playing a venue with tables that have all the information about your band, and he said the venues liked it, and it also is probably a cool thing for, you know, because clubs, a lot of times people aren't paying attention to who's playing or whatever, but if they see that, they're like, ah, oh, I like this band. And then that is a great idea. That's one of those tips. You know, we've got to start adding up these clever little tri- tips and tricks that our, uh, that our uh, listeners are always giving us, and then we're going to um, apply them to our own careers and uh, leave podcasting behind. That's right. <laughs> Give no credit. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Our next uh, Twitter comment. Hey guys, it's uh, well. I like to re- remain anonymous for this call, but 
uh, there seems to be a lot of going back and forth between people on whether or not Twitter is good. And, you know, it is if you use it properly, and it's not if you don't. And properly is whatever you want to use it for. But for me, the analogy I make is uh, Twitter is kind of like what the golf course used to be to business execs in the 80s. Yeah, you're in the office, but then your boss asks you to come with some of his buddies golfing and some wonderful side deals go on. And it's like, well, you know, yeah, I'm sitting there at my computer marketing or I'm sitting there or I go to shows and I'm working. Or, but you're on Twitter and you're being yourself and maybe you post that you're having a tuna sandwich or picking your nose or dancing or working on any track, but you're also being yourself to people who are your essentially your colleagues or fans. It's more a, mark, uh, more a networking tool than a marketing tool, but it, I, I see it as what the golf course used to be. The, you're off duty being yourself, but you're really working. And that's how it's worked for me. And that's what I'll leave at that. I'm from Portland, and uh, yeah, Portland's saturated, and it's clicky, and that's all I'm going to say about that. Thanks. <laughs> I think that clicky comment was... Aimed at you, Chris. <laughs> I, I don't know. I hope not. I didn't recognize the voice. It wasn't. I'm, I'm sorry if I've offended you in any way. But you didn't say Portland, Oregon, or Portland, Maine. Yeah, okay, but, let's just assume it's Maine. But uh, that still could be aimed at you because you're from Rhode Island. I know. That's pretty darn close. <laughs> um, Gosh, that, that actually kind of disturbs me because I always try and be like the least clicky <laughs> what, person in what the world. I think it was aimed towards him. <laughs> just, you just teased me. You're giving me a complex. <laughs> I'm a nice person. <laughs> Great. Now we're going to have to pay for his therapy. <laughs> I, I like that point, though. I think that uh, that looking at Twitter is sort of this being out on the golf course is a nice little analogy. It might not be the perfect analogy, but I yeah. think it is that sort of mix of business and pleasure. It's a casual space where you can casually meet people and talk, but then With also do this. With, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that's right. That's right. In your, in your golfer shorts. That's right. <laughs> that's right. All right. Sorry, Chris. I don't. I, you, everyone loves you. I hear more praise about you in town than anyone else. Then, then you do negative stuff. Then <laughs> everyone I meet. Oh, I know Chris Robley. He's great. So you're you're cool, man. Thanks. Thank you. All right. We've got one last set of calls. Hey, my name is Mike Sankari. I'm from New York City. Playing a band called Diablo Royale. I'm just listening to the podcast you do with Corey, Corey Smith, um, and I liked it. And I like really all all the podcasts you're doing. I'm wondering though, would you mind doing something that, that talks about a band. Um, all the advice seems to be uh, regarding singer-songwriters that are, that are kind of doing it solo. And uh, the reason I bring that up is just financially, it's mu- obviously much easier to truck one person around on a guitar rather than, you know, four or five people and on a lot more instruments. So I was just curious if, if you might want to do a podcast that looks at that, the band dynamic um, as opposed to the solo singer-songwriter dynamic. But uh, anyway, keep the advice coming. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Hi, you guys. My name is Lisa Lynn, and I'm calling from San Francisco, California. I just love your show. I look forward to your podcast every time. And I had kind of a neat story I wanted to share with you. Uh, I'm a harpist. I write my own music. I've always done well. I've had some major record labels and my own label going. And I actually came around to CD Baby pretty late. I actually thought I didn't really uh, need need it so much because I had a lot going on. But I did end up signing up about uh, several months ago, and I had only been on there for about two weeks when a cosmetics company chose one of my CDs to give for one of their gift baskets. So within a couple weeks of signing up to CD Baby, one of my CDs, which was actually Lullabies, uh, for babies, <laughs> was picked up by a cosmetics company, and they ordered 27,500 units. And it took a couple of months to do the deal, but it's all done. And just yesterday, I got the check for that many units. And I'm actually using it to buy my mother a house. <laughs> so it's a dream come true, all because of CD Baby. I play my harp in hospitals, and I do all kinds of cool stuff. That's why I had made a, a CD for babies. But... I just wanted to say thank you so much for doing a fantastic job. You do a great service. Your podcasts are always very rich, and I look forward to them all the time. Uh, for more information about me, my website is lisalynn.com, L-I-S-A-L-Y-N-N-E, lisalynn.com, and just uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. Bye. 
Hey guys, this is Nelson again, giving you guys a call from Chicago, Illinois, uh, Fronting Mountain Project, Courageous Rue. That's www.courageousrue.com. Uh, and I was calling with regards to the bundling podcast. I just got through it. And I was thinking about the very creepy call um, uh, that Bolton got uh, you know, from an admirer of his first name. And I was thinking maybe it would be a good idea for him to change it to scare off future callers that may come in and try to stalk him by changing his name to The Bolt. They just leave it at The Bolt. Who wants to mess with lightning? I mean, seriously. Bolton, if you can, please just take it under consideration. Love the podcast, and thanks for your time, guys. <laughs> All Bye. right, well, thanks for those calls. This <laughs> those change sweet. of yours is really... Really causing something. I kind of like the bolt. The bolt. The hey, bolt. I'm I'm from San Diego. I'm a Chargers fan. They're the they're simple as a. <laughs> they call them the bolts. Sometimes it's got power. Can, can we can can we just try real quick the beginning of the podcast and see what it sounds like if you say the bolt instead the of the bolt? All right. Yeah. I'm Kevin. I'm Kevin, today. and this is Chris. We both have boring names, but here is the bolt. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think it works. <laughs> You're not going to start wearing superhero outfits, are you? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Those other two uh, c- comments were pretty great. Uh, yeah. I remember you started working on a band-oriented podcast, and then someone stole your hard drive, right? With that, r- yeah. Actually, I had been working on a process where I was following a band, um, a local indie band here, through the process of making their album on their own at home. And uh, both uh, Bolton and I put in quite a few hours um, hanging out with the band and and just kind of tracking some progress. And uh, near the end, um, yeah, my car got broken into and my hard drive was stolen, so that that episode died. But I I agree that we need more bands on here. I mean, someone would probably think that, uh, you know, I choose people to interview based on that I love singer-songwriter music, but that's... Not true at all. I actually love bands way more. It's just, <laughs> I really had a hard time finding bands with interesting storylines going on. And I don't say that, that there aren't bands with good storylines going on. But almost every time a band approaches me about uh, being on the podcast, it's by a manager emailing me saying, we want to be on the podcast. They're, you know, got a good thing going on in such and such town. And I'll say... That's great. Tell me. What's the hook? Yeah, what's what's the the storyline? What do we have to offer? And this is, uh, you know, our podcast is geared towards artists. So it's got to have something that's interesting and pertains to them. And they never get back to me. Here's what we need to put out there. If you are an extremely dysfunctional band emotionally, personality-wise, you've got a lot of problems internally, but you're still together and you're still successful. We want to hear from you. Yes, we do. I don't think do. that n- narrows it down at all. I think that's every <laughs> band I've ever known. <laughs> Basically, if you're the modern day indie Fleetwood Mac, there you go. <laughs> Please, that's, that's let us a story know. we we will air. <laughs> no, but it's it's kind of been uh, frustrating to to you know not really have more bands on there. But uh, we did early on. You remember there was Moving Rushmore. We had. Uh, um, Matt from the Counting Crows, who talked a lot about their band dynamic. Well, that's Obviously, true, did, that's yeah. not uh, an indie band, but he did talk about a lot of the early days. And I, I would definitely like to have more bands on. And um, yeah, so if you're a band and you've got an interesting storyline, contact me. Or if you know a band that has an interesting storyline, I mean, that's how Josh Rosenthal ended up on the podcast. Somebody uh, emailed me, who was a listener of the show, and said, You've got to get Josh on there. He's got some cool stuff going on. And I did, so. Or if you're, you know, not just bands and singer-songwriters, if you're in a barbershop quartet, if you play in a symphony, if uh, you um, play in the circus. That's next episode. Next episode. Oh, that's right. right. (laughs) Shh. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But, yeah, so contact us with relevant storylines. If you listen to the podcast, you know what we're looking for. And uh, we'd love to have more bands on the show because there's there is definitely more uh, challenges to being in a band, whether it be the group dynamic, the cost uh, that like Mike the caller mentioned, the cost for taking a band out on the road, the ever popular fighting over how you're splitting your publishing money. That's right. Who's going to be forced to drive that really late shift that no one wants to drive? All the important things. So. 
What was the harp player's name? Lorena? Lisa Lynn. Lisa, that, I'm that, way off. That but Lisa. is an amazing story. Way to go. I, my yeah. jaw dropped when she said that. Yeah, when I was going through the voicemail, I I was I rewound that one a couple times. I'm like, wait a minute. At first I thought she said when she said twenty seven thousand, I I was thinking twenty seven hundred. Yeah. And she said, I bought a house. I'm like, What? You did not. And then I went back and she said they bought twenty seven thousand five hundred and I'm like and I did a little calculations, you know, and if she, who knows what she got per unit. I mean, right. I'm sure they didn't pay full price, but, uh, you know, if they paid you know, $10 for each CD, that's, you know, 275000 So even if they paid 10 or five, $5 a CD, that'll... I hope she set aside... Buy a whole for, neighborhood in Detroit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope she set aside a little for taxes, though. That, we'll see. Yeah. I mean, well, hopefully she's got some. Story. If it took her two months to work that deal, I'm sure that uh, there was some <laughs> good legal counsel involved. I'm hoping. So, yeah, Lisa, that's amazing. Thanks for sharing, and uh, uh, we'll be expecting the commission check because I'm right. sure we had a big <laughs> part of that. And see, see, artists sign up to CD Baby. Two weeks later, you'll be able to buy a new house. Exactly. That's the new <laughs> tagline. <laughs> Ooh, CD should... Baby got me a house. <laughs> Late night television. I need ads. to update our website copy with that. <laughs> yeah. But it is cool because she does harp music. And um, I think, to me, the most important thing that you can learn from this is that, uh, you know, um, someone like a harpist may think that their music doesn't have broad appeal or doesn't have big opportunities like pop music. Um, does and uh, but they're wrong. I mean, there are big opportunities, and it's a matter of just getting your music in a place where people are searching for it. And uh, we do have a ton of people hitting our site searching for interesting and off outside of the mainstream type music. So, um, my wife, uh, who edits films, has actually found uh, I think three or four different artists that she's ended up using in the soundtracks, or uh, you know to go along with the films just surf, surf, surfing around on CD Baby so wow yeah, so cool. that that next house might be just there waiting for you <laughs> <laughs> so. alright well I think uh, that does it so yeah feel free to call us and leave your success stories like Lisa did we thank her for that and I don't think that's the first time she called it I'm pretty sure she called in before but I could be wrong um but uh, success stories, comments, thoughts, feedback. Nick Band bands, suggestions. Band suggestions, threats over Bolton's name change or ideas <laughs> of how he can spice it up a little more. And uh, you can call us at 206-426-5683. Email us info cdbabypodcast.com. And comment on the website, cdbabypodcast.com. And I think that's it. I am the Bolt! <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, now he's going to have a big head about it. <laughs> we'll catch you next time. <laughs> you finally discovered who you are. <laughs> I'm going to put some reverb on that. <laughs> <laughs>